بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الملك ائتوني به فلما جاءه الرسول قال ارجع إلى ربك فاسأله ما بال النسوة التي قطعن أيديهن إن ربي بكيدهن عليم قال ما خطبكن إذ راودتن يوسف عن نفسه قلنا حاش لله ما علمنا عليه من سوء قالت امرأة العزيز الآن حصحص الحق أنا راودته عن نفسه وإنه لمن الصادقين ذلك ليعلم أني لم أخنه بالغيب وأن الله لا يهدي كيد الخائنين وما أبرئ نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي إن ربي غفور رحيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد We've discussed about the release of Yusuf عليه السلام from the prison but he did not just want to be released and freed without proving his innocence. He wanted his innocence to be proven. He wanted his name to be cleared. And so he used a very polite language to do so. He told the messenger that came to bring him the news of his release, of his freedom. He told him, go back and ask your Lord about those ladies, those women. So he did not specify a name. He did not give a, an individual. He kept it very general. Those ladies who cut off their fingers, and we mentioned the story last time. So this, of course, prompted the king then to act upon this and investigate into this. So he brought those ladies and an investigation was conducted at which time they could not deny. They use a very interesting language, just like he used a very interesting language. He said, go and ask those ladies about what happened. And so when the king asked them, why did you guys want Yusuf to commit a sin or try to seduce him to commit the sin, the crime? Their reply, they said, God forbid. That's the same sentence they used when they saw Yusuf, alayhi salam. When they saw Yusuf, they also said, وَقُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرًا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ God forbid, this, this can't be a human being. This is an angel from God. It is said, now Yusuf, of course, had an extreme beauty. He had that handsome, handsome, ha handsomeness, if there is such a word. But 
It is said the people of Egypt at the time, most of them, most of them were dark skinned, most of them. Yusuf alayhi salam was lighter skinned. Remember he was from Palestine, not from Egypt itself. He was brought to Egypt. So in addition to that, he also was very handsome looking. So when they saw him, they said, Hasha lillah. And here, Hasha lillah, they say it's tanzih. Tanzih means that he is well above the race of humanity. This, this guy is not a human being. He's well above the human beings. And that's why they say he's an angel. They use the same clause when the king asked them, why did you try to seduce Yusuf? They said no. They said, again, قُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ No, no, no. He's well above such accusations. This man is innocent. He's far above the accusations of being accused of falling for a sin or a seduction. No, no, no. He's well above that. قُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ So this is another proof that, of course, this man was innocent. The thought of committing the sin did not even cross his mind. Not even the thought. They say that. Hasha lillah. No, no. Not even a thing crossed his mind. Not even a thing was shown. This man did not do anything wrong. Qulna hasha lillah. And then they confirm it. Ma alimna alayhi min su. We never saw anything wrong from him. Nothing. So all these traditions, all these stories that say that this man committed a sin or thought about committing the sin, we reject all these traditions. None of them stand true and valid with what the Quran says. The hadith, the traditions of Ahlul Bayt السلام, they tell us that any tradition you see, first of all, see what the Quran says. If the tradition agrees with the Quran, go with it. If it doesn't agree with what the Quran says, leave it aside. Keep it aside. And these traditions or these stories that say he thought about committing the sin or he thought about, for example, in fact, he was about to engage in committing the sin, we say they contradict what the Quran says. And so we all leave them aside. All prophets are infallible. So, now in the court... The king is questioning these ladies and apparently that lady, the minister's wife, whose name is not mentioned in the Quran, but some books of ahadith and tradition tell us that her name was Zulaikha. Also, I've also read that her name was Ra'il. Ra'il. So either one, Ra'il or Zulaikha. She was there, she was present. Now when she saw this, she saw these ladies defending Yusuf alayhi salam and the king is investigating into this, she could not keep quiet anymore. It's like, you know, a volcano that erupted. And this is something interesting. She says, Aziz. She could not keep quiet anymore. Although she was not in the picture yet, nobody said anything. These ladies from the verses did not say she was the one who invited us, she was the one who brought us the fruit, and she gave us the knot. They did not even mention her. Nor did Yusuf alayhi salam mention her. Nothing. But she couldn't. She couldn't stop anymore. She couldn't handle this anymore. It was too much. Finally, she admits, Aziz, now the truth surfaces. The truth has come up now. I was the one who tried to seduce him. And he is indeed indeed among the truthful. He's truthful. All these claims that he's been saying, they're true. I was the one. Here's an interesting thing here. Before we continue on with the tafsir. The oppressor, a valim, a tyrant, no matter how much he might appear to enjoy life, oppression brings guilt to the heart. Any tyrant you see in the world today, and by tyrant or oppression, oppressive, you have degrees of oppression. You have somebody, for example, who might kill millions of people. 
Or you have a tyrant or an oppressive, maybe in the house, somebody in his own house, he's an oppressive tyrant in the house. When he comes to the house, he becomes a dictator. And if you give this man the opportunity to become a leader of a, a country or a city, he'll also become a dictator. But he doesn't get that opportunity. So that is any person who commits any act of oppression will never feel happy, will never feel joy. You know, sometimes people say when they come, I don't know if you've experienced this, but a person might say that, you know what? I told so-and-so that I lied to him or I lied to her. Or that, for example, I did his ghibah, I asked him to forgive me. And then they say, I felt like a heavy rock was on my chest and that heavy rock is lifted. I don't know if you've heard that expression or maybe some of us may have experienced that. Have now, what is that rock? It's not physical rock. It's a virtual rock, but on the spirit, on the spirituality of the individual. And that's why, brothers and sisters, always try to be on the side of the truth. Because like we mentioned last week, the truth will always prevail. Always. It's, it's, it's a law. That's a law. Even if it takes centuries. Last time we talked about Galileo. 350 years after his death, the church apologizes to what was done to Galileo. 350 years later. It will take centuries sometimes, but the truth will come. You can't hide from the truth. So always go with the truth. And sometimes it's difficult. You know, in some parts of Iraq and maybe other countries in the Middle East, they have what's called the tribal system. There are tribes. And so sometimes what happens is a member of the tribe goes and steals from the other tribe, from another tribe. A thief. Now the other tribe gets upset, this guy is stealing from us, so maybe they catch him and they discipline him. He goes back home disciplined. His tribesmen, the members of his tribe, they find that their own tribesmen is getting disciplined by the other tribes. They get upset. How dare you guys discipline our man? And you find them picking up their rifles and mashallah, you know, a war engages. Literally, where people die, tens of people might die. Now, luckily, alhamdulillah, we don't have guns, you know, in here, at least between tribes, alhamdulillah, you know. Although nowadays on the streets, mashallah, we see them, you know, all these drive-by shootings and everything. Nonetheless, there, those people, they're acting out of their tribes mentality, not the justice. Your own tribesman is a thief. He needs to be disciplined. I mean, go tell him, tell him what you did was wrong. This is not right. Don't do this again. And instead of going and fighting with the other individual. And sometimes we go through this, unfortunately, too. Because he is my cousin or she is my sister, I will always side with her or with him. Even though I know he's wrong or I choose not to see that he's wrong. We have a problem sometimes. When we like somebody, we make them a saint. He becomes a saint. Everything he does is correct. But when we dislike someone, he becomes worse than Iblis, worse than the devil. Anything he does or she does is wrong. Everything. Follows. But that's not the Islamic akhlaq. That is not the Islamic manners. We have to go where the truth is. Not where my cousin is or where my sister is or where my brother is. No, where is the truth? Even if it is not with the side of the family. I don't care. I don't care. I go with what the truth is, where the truth lies. That's where I will be. You know, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, alayhi salam, on the day of Ashura, on the morning of Ashura, he was called by Umar ibn Sa'd and Shimr ibn dhul Jawshan. Him and Ali al-Akbar, both of them. They were called. So Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Imam Hussein's brother, didn't want to go. Nor did Ali al-Akbar want to go. But Imam Hussein said, you know, what have you got to lose? Go, see at least what they have to say. So he said, okay, Abu Abdullah. They accepted and they both went. Umar ibn Sa'd and Shimr, they told 
Imam Hussein's brother and his son, Ali al-Akbar. They told him, they told them both, you guys have distant relationships with us. We have relationships together through their mother's side. From the mother's side, there was a relationship. So we don't want to kill you guys. Why don't you switch over, come here, come with us, and we'll make you have a good life, a happy life, you'll enjoy it, we'll give you everything you want. Now this is a moment of decision here. This is a moment of truth. This is a moment when the genuine side will show up. Now we will say this is I mean, obvious. No, 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 no. If we try to put ourselves in the shoes of those two men at that time, when on one side it is de death, death, خلص. there's no choice. There is death. And they know certain death is there. On this side though, life, you can live. At least the physical life is there. Physical life is there. Plus, not just a physical life, a comfortable physical life. He would have gotten anything he wanted had he switched sides. But he did not go with the tribe's mentality or my relationship with you guys mentality. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas replied, he said, may, there, may you not have had a mother. Thakalatka <laughs> ummuk. You give me the safety. And the son of Rasulullah doesn't have any safety. You're telling me I'm going to be safe and he is not going to be safe? What kind of safety and life is this? Go away. And he turns back. That is where the truth is. The truth is with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So I'll go with the truth. I don't care if I, lie, uh, I live or I die. That's where the truth is. Now how many of us have that? That's why Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, that's one of the reasons Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam says that my uncle al-Abbas has a rank in Jannah that all the martyrs would feel envious of him because of that rank. All the martyrs. And he has two wings that he flies with in the paradise just like his uncle Ja'far al-Tayyar. Salamullahi alayhi. So this is where we have to think where the truth is. Because the minute we decide to side away from the truth, that's when the guilt comes in, the conscious. The conscious of the human being kicks in. And every human being, even the dictators, believe me, they don't sleep their nights. In fact, the more tyrant and oppressive a man becomes, or a woman becomes, the weaker he or she is. That's also a law. How do we learn this from our Imam alayhi salam? In a dua that is recommended to be recited on Thursday night. Allahumma man ta'abba wa a'adda wa sta'adda li wafarati ila makhluqin raja'a rifdihi wa talabina ilihi wa ja'izatihi and so on and so forth. That dua on Thursday night. It, ha it comes all the way to, the, to this part. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ يَا إِلَٰهِ أَنَّ لَيْسَ فِي حُكْمِكَ ظُلْمٌ وَلَا فِي نِقْمَتِكَ عَجَلَةٌ وَإِنَّمَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَى الظُّلْمِ الضَّعِيفِ وَإِنَّمَا يَعْجَلُ مَنْ يَخَافُ الْفَوْتِ وَيَحْتَاجُ إِلَى الظُّلْمِ الضَّعِيفِ وَقَدْ تَعَالَيْتَ يَا إِلَٰهِ عَنْ ذَٰلِكَ عُلُوًّا كَبِيرًا He says the Imam alayhi salam says in this dua, in the part of the dua that we're interested in here, he says, Ya Allah, and I know for certainty that in your judgments, there is no oppression, nor do you rush, nor do you rush to punish. Allah does not rush to punish us. He says in the Quran, if I were to rush the punishment upon the people or the creation, there would not be left a single crea creation on the earth. We'd all be killed. We'd all be killed instantaneously. But God gives us time. He doesn't rush. He gives us time to repent, to go back to him. So he says, my Lord, I know that you do not rush. No, do you oppress. Why? He justifies. Because only a person who fears that he will miss, all time will pass him, rushes. When you, for example, have an appointment and you rush because you're getting late. Why do you rush? Because you think you're going to miss that appointment. And that's why you rush. God is not going to miss his appointment. You know, he doesn't need to rush. And... He says, you would not need to be oppressive because only a weak person or a weak individual 
needs to be oppressive. And you're not weak, Ya Allah. You're the all-powerful one. You're the mighty one. Great. And indeed, you'll find all those dictators. Look at the dictators, you know, from this last century, from this century. The minute, for example, he feels himself losing the battle, he either commits suicide or they find him in a hole. Although he comes on TV, you know, with his missiles and his, and his weapons, surrounded by all his army men, the minute you take away the army men, خلص, that's it. You find him running away. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, he had his army around him. Yes, he was mighty and powerful. Take away the army from him. Take away his army. Imam Ali comes to him in the battle of Safin at the very beginning of the battle. He says, Ya Muawiyah, this war is between you and me. Why cause any bloodshed? We have issues to settle. Let's come. You and I, one on one. You kill me, خلص, you have it all. I kill you, it's over. War is over. Why cause any bloodshed? Between the Muslims. Let's come. Muawiyah turns to Amr ibn al-As. He says, what do you think of his proposal? Amr ibn al-As says, yeah, Muawiyah, the man is calling you. And it's a shame and embarrassment not to respond to the call of a knight. He says, yeah, ibn al-As, you want me to be killed, so you become the Khalifa. <laughs> Who would go and face Ali ibn Abi Talib in a battlefield? You think I'm insane? I'm crazy? Let it be a shame. Let it be an embarrassment. Call it whatever you want, but at least let me stay alive here. So, this is Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. That's it. Even though he had the army, he had the military, he had the power, he later became the Khalifa, or so-called Khalifa. Take away the army, take away everything, and see what you're left with. Nothing. Nothing. All oppressive tyrants are like this. You find a man in the house is a dictator. He goes outside, you find him so weak, can't even open his mouth with a word. But in the house, he becomes a hero. Or a woman. With other women, she's weak. But when it comes with certain other ladies where she has power, she influences her power. These individuals never sleep their night. Their conscience constantly bugs them. Bugs them. And the example here in the Quran is a great one. The lady who was the wife of the minister, the Aziz, even though her name was not mentioned, she was not even referred to in the whole conversation, but she was sitting through it. And she could not help it. This big rock on her chest was there. She couldn't stop it anymore. So she had to get rid of this rock. She had to throw it away. This guilt, her conscience was killing her on the inside. So she had to speak. And then she spoke. What did she say? Now the truth has surfaced. I was the one who tried to seduce him. He is indeed um, the truthful. Then the ayat number 52 and 53 continue. The verses read, ذَٰلِكَ لِيَعْلَمَ أَنِّي لَمْ أَخُنْهُ بِالْغَيْبِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي كَيْدَ الْخَائِنِينَ That so that he knows that I did not deceive him in his absence or in the absence and Allah indeed does not guide those who are deceitful or those who deceive. And then, and I do not claim that I am innocent on my own. I did this on my own. Indeed, the nafs commands evil. And we'll come to that, inshallah. Except what my Lord blesses us with mercy. Indeed, he is all forgiving, all merciful. Verses 52 and 53. Now the question is, who said these two sentences or these two verses? Was it the wife of the king or was it Yusuf, alayhi salam? And here there seems to be a differences of opinion between the interpreters of the Quran. Some, like Al-Allama Al-Tabatawai, Allah Ta'ala Alayh, says, this is Yusuf, alayhi salam. So she said that now the truth has surfaced, and I was the one who seduced him, and he is among the truthful, and that's it. This is the end of her conversation. 
Then Yusuf alayhi salam replies or continues the conversation after the news reaches him that, you know, the lady confessed. She said now what the truth is. So now he says that so that my Lord knows that I did not cheat him. So that the king or the minister knows that I did not deceive him. I did not cheat him. And Allah does not support those who deceive. And then he says, why it is Yusuf who said this? He gives reasons. One, first of all, he says that Yusuf alayhi salam, if it were the lady, the wife of the king, she would not say dhalika. Dhalika means that. Li'a'lama. In the Arabic language, she would have used a different language. He uses the Arabic language. We don't have time to get much into it as to why. But he says, if it were her saying it, she would not say ذَلِكَ. She says, وَلْيَعْلَمَ. She would add wow, not ذَلِكَ. She would replace the wow with a what? The ذَلِكَ with a what? For an Arabic reason, a linguistic reason. Because then he says it makes more sense. That would be a matter of sense. Otherwise, it would mean that means that if I had said this, I did whatever I did so that he knows, the king knows that I did what I did. He says it doesn't make sense you know, to say this, to repeat it twice. So for a linguistic reason, he says no, it is not her. Then he says, what about the part that says, Wama nafsi. I don't make myself innocent. What does that mean? Yusuf is not innocent. He says, yes, he is innocent. But Yusuf wants to tell those people that, you know what? Listen, people, I'm a human being just like you guys. Because in a society, in a society that is full of corruption, that society that he used to live in is a society that had no values, no, no values, full of corruption. Like we see in the societies we live in today, the societies we live in today, for example, adultery is not a sin. Committing the sin between a man and a woman out of wedlock, not a sin. I mean, in, in this country, it's not a sin. There's no laws to punish for that, for example. It's fine. So people can commit some, some of these sins without being, you know, even looked after. That's it. Follows. It's done. So when you have a society that is full of corruption like this, like such, then you have a man who resists all these temptations. A person who thinks so clearly that when he is about to be released, he says, no, I'm not going to be released until you guys prove my innocence. This individual, is he really a human being? Maybe he is an angel of God. Maybe this guy is not a human. Who would have all this power? He is trying to tell them, no, no, I am a human being. If I want to disobey God Almighty, I can. But no, I don't do that. I have that evil commanding nafs. It's also in me. However, the mercy of my Lord, when it comes and bestows upon me, then it makes my mind always in charge now I had several lectures about the nafs, the one that commands to evil, the one that is the conscious, the second nafs, and the third nafs that is a nafsul mutma'inna. If anybody is interested, you can refer to the Muharram lectures, the whole series of the Muharram lectures found online about the nafs. What is that nafs? So I will not repeat it here again and get into it again. But this nafs, the evil commanding nafs, the self that commands to do evil, he says, even I have it. However, I know how to control it. So I'm a human be be people. Be aware that I'm a human. I didn't have these powers like a superpower, you know, superpower. You know, like, you know, Superman or whatever other superheroes you have there. You know, I didn't get these supernatural powers. I got them from God Almighty. God gave them to me. He gave me these powers. So I'm a human being like you guys. And then he says, Inna Rabbi ghafurun. Rahim, that indeed my Lord is all forgiving, all merciful. That's the, th the thought that Yusuf alayhi salam said this. 
There is another opinion of other interpreters of Quran who say no, it was the wife of the Pharaoh who said uh, the wife of the Pharaoh who said this, or that minister. She's the one who said this. This is said by Al Alama Nasr Makaram Shiraz in his tafsir al Amthal. He, for example, goes with that opinion. He says there is nothing wrong with such a lady who is full, for example, of sin that once she sees the truth. She just migrates to the whole truth and then she starts saying some words of admonishment like these. It could be possible. And he says, this is what happened in this case. And he uses some reason. Uh, one of his reasons, again, because of dhalike, that word dhalike. You know, sometimes Arabic language is very interesting. And that's why I tell people always, if you want to really understand the meaning of the Quran, make sure you go with the Arabic language. That doesn't mean we cannot read the English. No, read the English. That's fine. Get an idea of what the verses are saying. That's good. Get some understanding. It's important. However, don't rely upon the English translation to derive laws. MashaAllah. Yeah. Don't rely. Otherwise, the microphone will fall. Yeah. So, don't rely upon that to derive religious laws. No. So here he uses the word dalika. He says dalika is a justification. Justification. She started the conversation when she says the truth has surfaced. She started that conversation and hence there is no reason for her to disconnect her conversation and switch over to Yusuf. She continues with the conversation. So these are the two opinions. Whether it is Yusuf alayhi salam who said it or whether it was the wife of the Minister who said it, one of them said it, that indeed the Lord should know that I did not cheat him, this minister, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not support those who deceive. And I'm a human being like you guys, I'm a human being, I have an evil commanding soul or self, but my Lord is the one who can give me the power to use my mind always and not follow my desires blindly. But keep the mind in control, keep the desires in control and the anger in control. And this makes me in charge. It is said one day when Yusuf alayhi salam became the king and he became the Aziz of Masr, of Egypt. It is said one day he was walking by a road and his son was with him. Yusuf's son. This is many years later. He finds a lady begging on the street. A lady is begging on the street. As he walks next to her, she says, Alhamdulillah, Alladhi ja'al al-abida mulukan bita'atihim. وَجَعَلَ الْمُلُوكَ عَبِيدًا بِمَعْصِيَتِهِمْ She said, Praise be to God Almighty, the Lord, who makes the slaves become kings because of their obedience to Him. They obey God and they become kings. And praise be to Him, the one who makes the kings become slaves because of their disobedience. You know, we read in Dua Kumail, Allahumma ghfir liya dhunuba allati tughayyirun ni'am. Oh God, forgive these sins that change the blessings. There are certain sins a person commits that will transform him from being a king or a wealthy person into, God forbid, a poor man or a poor person. So she said this, Yusuf's son got intrigued by this statement. So he turned to his father, he said, Father, who is this lady who's saying this? Yusuf السلام, turns to her, he finds an old woman, approaches her, looks more carefully, and goes who it is. It is Zulaikha, that wife of the minister. And he told her, he said, Ya Zulaikha, I have a question to ask you. She said, Yes, Ya Yusuf. He said, What drove you? to do what you did back in the palace. What made you do it? Tell me. She said, 
Ya Yusuf, I could not bear to stand the beauty of your face. You had such a beautiful, handsome face that I couldn't resist it. And that's what made me do what I did. He told her, Ya Zuleikha, you think I'm handsome? She said, yes. He said, what would you say about a prophet who will come after me? He is the last of the prophets. And his name is Muhammad, sallu ala Muhammad. And my beauty is a fraction of his. My beauty is a fraction of his. She looked at Yusuf alayhi salam and she said, yes, you're right. He says, how do you know I'm right? She says, because the minute you mentioned the name Muhammad, I felt that something happened in my heart. The love of this name fell into my heart. That name sounds so beautiful. What about the man who carries this name or holds this name? It is said, Jibra'il alayhi salam then came down upon Yusuf alayhi salam and said, Ya Yusuf, Allah sends his salams to you and says, this lady is truthful in her love to his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So tell her that God has forgiven her sins and he tells you that to tell her that she will be turned into youth again and you can marry her. And indeed he married her. So after all, Zulaikha got what she wanted. You know, but, but in the halal, you know, in the halal, there is a difference here. You know, so this means that sometimes the ladies will get what they want, you know, inshallah. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah, mashallah, we have cheering there. You know. So sooner or later, they'll get it, you know. But it has to be through halal means, huh? not the haram means, through lawful means. Yeah. So the sisters have to think of lawful ways of getting what they want, you know. So as long as they don't plot, you know, in, in a negative way, plotting in a positive sense, yeah, that's allowed. So here is something interesting that we will touch upon later as well, inshallah, but I'll just mention it briefly here. We believe in our aqidah, in our faith, that all the prophets, all of them, they knew of our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They knew of him. And they knew of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam They know of them. And they told people about our Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam All of them. And that's why every society that came, even before our society, every nation that came who had a Prophet, and knew there will be a Prophet at the end of time whose name is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And if the mere love of his name can turn a woman to become like this, imagine what about us? How much love do we have for this man? And how much love do we carry for him and his family? Do we really love them that much? If we do, then we don't have to worry about anything in this world or the hereafter. خلص, that's it. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are the sincere lovers and followers of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Raise your hands for the dua. We have many individuals who have called and requested their dua or to pray for them. A lady who's undergone surgery or undergone surgery. Another lady who is also in need of help. And there are two children who are undergoing <coughs> surgeries this week or underwent surgeries. Many people are requesting our dua. We all have hajat. Let's recite this verse together, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amma yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-su' Amma yujibu المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر
المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما أن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين يا الله اللهم اقض حوائجنا جميعا بحق الزهراء فاطمة يا الله اللهم شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم ألبسهم لباس العافية يا الله اللهم اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما رباني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح موات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات Allah